Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Schroeder. Hey, Jim, thanks for joining us tonight. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks for having me here. My name is, is Jim Schrader and I'm an assistant professor of physics at Wheaton College in Illinois. Wheaton is a Western suburb of Chicago. So if you start in downtown Chicago and just go straight West by 25 miles, you end up in the city of Wheaton. We used to be a, a standalone town, but we've been swept up in suburbia for some time. The title of my talk tonight is Shedding Light on Earth's Light Show, How Waves and Particles Produce Northern Lights. And I'd like to thank Jennifer and Tom and all the Distinctive Voices uh, crew for inviting me to be a part of this lecture series. It's an honor to be a part of anything that's associated with the National Academy. So before I dive in, I, I don't want to give anybody the impression tonight that this work you're about to see was my work individually. This is work that was done collaboratively with the, the folks that are listed here on the screen. So these are, these are my co-authors. And there's also a number of funding agencies, including NSF, DOE, and NASA that supported this work. And without their, their support, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Before I, I get into the science of, of Northern Lights, I wanna just give this talk in, in the memory or in, in honor of National Academy member, Don Garnett, who passed away last week. Uh, Don was a founding member or, or one of the earliest members of the US space physics community and uh, had uh, decades worth of experience. And I was fortunate enough as a student to take classes with him in grad school. He not only was an incredible scientist, but also a great teacher um, and had some really powerful words of encouragement for me when I was a student that, that continue to uh, inspire me and, and carry with me in my early career. So uh, just for a little bit of context, before I start talking about Northern Lights, uh, there's, there's two reasons really why we study Northern Lights. And one reason is because Northern Lights are beautiful and we don't fully understand them. There's some physics there that we'd like to know no more about. And there's just kind of this fundamental aspect of discovery that we're pursuing when we want to understand Northern Lights or more generally uh, what are called auroras. But there's this broader category of phenomena called uh, space weather and associated effects with space weather that we also want to study. And that's the second reason for studying Northern Lights because changes in space around the earth can not only produce Northern Lights, but also have impacts on all sorts of different infrastructure. So things like satellites and communications networks, our GPS network, but the, the changes that happen in space can also couple all the way down to the ground and be connected to like our power grids and even the distribution of utilities under the ground as well can be affected by changes that happen out in space near Earth. This, this region of space near Earth is called geospace. And the variations that occur in that space are, are called space weather. And so an effort to understand Northern Lights and the, the things that actually produce Northern Lights is simultaneously an effort to understand space weather better. And of course, we're, we're more susceptible than we've ever been, or we're more dependent than we've ever been on these uh, pieces of infrastructure that are uh, affected or can be affected by space weather. So now looking at auroras or looking at Northern Lights, it's known that leading up to an aurora is the precipitation of electrons. Electrons come raining down from space. They're shown here on this picture as pink raindrops and they come crashing into the atmosphere and one of the things that can occur is a precipitating electron can crash into an atmospheric atom. And this collision between an atom and a precipitating electron can transfer energy to the atmospheric atom. And eventually that atom, which is in an excited state shown here as a, as a, a star, that atom in an excited state can relax and fall back down to a lower energy level. So uh, it, atoms that are excited that gain extra energy don't stay in their excited state forever. Eventually they give off that extra energy in the form of light. And so a, a little flash of light, a photon is produced. So this is one precipitating electron interacting with one atom and producing a photon. And that would be imperceptible to uh, our human eyes. But if there's a bunch of electrons that are coming, raining down into the atmosphere, interacting with a whole bunch of atoms in the atmosphere, that can produce 
an array of photons, and that's what makes up the Northern Lights, or that's what makes up an aurora. Now think about the scale over which all of this unfolds. The, the process, as we'll see, that leads up to an aurora starts at the sun and goes all the way to the earth, which is 150 million kilometers. But the light that actually composes an aurora is produced only 100 kilometers overhead, somewhere between 100 and 400 kilometers. And so this is the effects of space physics pressing right up against our faces, relatively speaking, right? Compared to 150 million kilometers, 100 kilometers is right nearby. Now, a lot of the effort to understand auroras better focuses on what's happening out in space to cause electrons to precipitate. So this is the focus of a lot of auroral research, the, the precipitation of electrons. And I have two questions that I'm gonna focus on tonight when I'm talking about this research. These will be guiding questions as we go through the talk. One question is where do precipitating electrons come from and what causes them to precipitate? So these are our guiding questions as we go forward. Now, by way of background, we know that space is filled up with plasma and it's filled up with a, a gas of ions and electrons, which is plasma. So the, the common kind of grade school way that um, states of matter are taught is that there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And the, the lesson often ends there to, to my dismay and the dismay of many of my colleagues, because there's an additional state of matter, a fourth state of matter called plasma. So the way that you go from one state of matter to another is by adding energy. Right? By adding energy, you can go from solid to liquid. By adding additional energy, you can go from liquid to gas. And those two phase transitions, the energy that's, that's put into the material actually uh, overcomes forces between the atoms themselves. So breaking apart the bonds of the solid and breaking apart the adhesion of the liquid. But the next phase change going from gas to plasma, the additional energy that's put into the material actually overcomes the forces within the atom itself. And so, you know, an atom is made up of a nucleus, there's electrons around the atom. And if additional energy is put into the gas, the force of attraction holding the electrons to the nucleus can be overcome and the electrons can be separated and move around freely. The nucleus that's left behind, which is now called an ion, can also move around. And so that separation, that breaking apart or ionizing of the atoms is what produces plasma. So plasma is made up of electrons and ions. And plasmas are remarkably complex. This is because they have gas dynamics, things like pressure and temperature. Uh, they can support sound waves. They can also have shock waves. So there's all the normal gas dynamics that happen within a plasma. But then in addition, there can also be electrodynamics or there, there is electrodynamics presence, present in the plasma as well. And that's coming from the electrons and ions exerting electric and magnetic forces on each other. There can be currents that flow through a plasma and there can be electromagnetic waves in plasma as well. So plasmas have all of these things happening simultaneously, which makes them intellectually a really interesting thing to study because they're complicated. Now there are uh, interesting ways to try to harness the complex behaviors of plasma. So I know many of you are from uh, the Irvine area, right across the street from Irvine, from UC Irvine is the D3D tokamak, which is a plasma experiment looking to harness the capabilities of plasma to actually produce fusion energy, which would be a new energy source for, uh, for mankind. So actually that would be combining small atoms to, to harvest the energy instead of breaking apart larger atoms with fission. So that's, that's one way that the complex and unique behaviors of plasmas can be harnessed. There are other industries that are built up around the behaviors of plasma, like for example, manufacturing computer chips. The, the manufacturing process can use plasma, the behaviors of plasma to try to accomplish uh, delicate and very small scale uh, manufacturing processes. So places like Intel use plasma in their, their manufacturing. But plasma is also very important for understanding space. And this is because space is filled up with electrons and ions. It's filled up with plasma. So actually, as we look at the universe, 
if we look out and just take a survey of what we see in the universe, what we find is that most of the visible matter in the universe, as much as 99% by some estimates, 99% of the matter in the universe, the visible matter, may be in the plasma state. And so this would include things like stars and nebulas and accretion disks and jets. So stars are, are hot enough, they have high enough temperature that they're in that fourth state of matter. The, the, the atoms have been broken apart. Nebulas are diffuse enough that the ionized atoms don't recombine. And accretion disks are uh, made up of material that collect around compact objects like neutron stars. And as that, that material swirls around and collects around, uh, it starts to warm up and goes into the plasma state as well. So you'll notice, I'm being careful here, when I talk about visible matter. Visible matter in the universe is largely in the plasma state. So I'm not making a claim about dark energy or dark matter. I, I don't know what those things are made of. If I did, I would have a Nobel Prize. Um, but it is notable that of the visible matter, the things that we can see, that is largely in the plasma state. So let's come back closer to home and think about our solar system. The solar system itself is actually filled up with plasma and this plasma comes from the sun. So I'm gonna show you a video that was taken by the SOHO satellite that stands for Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. And in the middle of this video is an occulting disk it blocks the bright surface of the sun. And so that allows the video to focus on the atmosphere of the sun. And what you'll see is that there's a always present streams of material coming out from the sun, and that's plasma streaming off from the sun, filling up the solar system. This is called the solar wind. So here it is. The solar wind is streaming off of the surface of the sun but it's not a steady stream. It's, it's not uh, constant in that it's you know, always coming off with the same amount and the same velocity. Sometimes it's quite bursty. There are explosions that occur. And it's these variations in the plasma coming off of the sun, these variations in the solar wind that cause space weather back at earth. And you'll actually see one of the important effects of space weather in just a minute. There'll be quite a large explosion right there and quite a bit of snow or, or fuzz that was created in the camera image. So that's one effect of space weather that, that we want to understand better. And that, that's actually due to solar energetic particles. So particles uh, accelerated at the sun to nearly the speed of light. And then they come streaming out from the sun and crash into the satellite and actually interact with the electronics of the satellite. And so here it's relatively benign, right? We get some fuzz on the image and it goes away. But it's not, it's not always benign, the effects of these energetic particles. Sometimes satellites have to go into safe mode and that would interrupt the, the service that's being provided by that satellite in order to protect them from the energetic particles. But the takeaway message here is that the sun is sending out this stream of plasma called the solar wind into the solar system. Now coming back even closer to home, is what's called the magnetosphere. So the magnetosphere is a region around the earth where earth is the main magnetic presence. Earth creates a magnetic field in its core and we're used to thinking about that magnetic field at the surface of the earth, right? We have our, our compass that points towards the North Pole, um, but we don't often stop to think about the fact that that magnetic field doesn't stop at the surface, it continues out into space. And so there's this bubble of space around the earth, which is called the magnetosphere. And earth is the main magnet in that space. And it turns out that as the sun sends its solar wind streaming past the earth and streaming past the magnetosphere, that fills up this region of space with plasma. So if we were to, to zoom in, and let's just make a conceptual drawing of what we would see if we could zoom in to a microscopic level, we would see electrons and ions. So if we zoom in, we see these electrons and ions, the plasma of the solar wind, which has made its way into Earth's magnetosphere. And then also in this region are magnetic field lines shown on this conceptual drawing as, as black vertical lines. These are the magnetic field lines of the Earth. So if we zoom in even further and just focus on what one single electron is doing, we get a picture that looks like this. 
So one single electron out of this whole mess of electrons would be doing what's called cyclotron motion. So if you can think back to introductory physics, there's something called the Lorentz force or QV cross B force. And the effect of that force is to pull electrons around in a circle, in a spiral, around magnetic field lines. And so this electron is doing this beautiful dance of spiraling around the magnetic field. And that is the most fundamental motion of a charged particle in the presence of magnetic field. Now let's work backwards, right? We've thought about one electron and the motion that that one electron will have. But if we go back to this middle drawing, all of those electrons would be spiraling around. And actually all of the ions would be spiraling around too. And so what we would see if this were an animation are the, the, the spiraling motion of electrons and ions being uh, as they, they travel along the magnetic field lines. Okay, so now let's step backwards again and go back to this picture of the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere is filled up with ions and electrons. It's filled up with plasma and that those ions and electrons can spiral along magnetic field lines. And so that brings us to a simple explanation, what I'm actually gonna call the oversimplified explanation of electron precipitation. That we have this simple explanation that electrons and ions in Earth's magnetic field are guided along the magnetic field lines down towards the poles. And that's why we see auroras around Earth's poles. And actually this is what you commonly hear if you pick up an introductory physics textbook. It'll say uh, particles from the sun are funneled along Earth's magnetic field and that produces auroras, end of story. But a moment of thought reveals that's not actually sufficient to explain many common details of auroras. So for example, one of the most striking things about auroras is the diversity of appearance that they can have. So for example, some auroras are streaky and others are hazy as you look at them. The, the streaky auroras are called discrete auroras. They have these well-defined bands of light and uh, those bands of light kind of wiggle and writhe around. And then there are also uh, different types of auroras that are sometimes more hazy and those are called diffuse auroras. So let's, let's pause for a minute and think about what must be happening to create a, a streaky, discrete aurora. To create an aurora like this, there would have to be electrons coming down, precipitating down from space and striking the atmosphere that have this type of pattern. So this type of pattern would be created by the electrons streaming down. And so that means that whatever is out there pushing electrons or causing them to precipitate whatever's doing that would have this type of shape or this type of pattern to it as well. And that's remarkably different from whatever would be causing diffuse auroras. So the, the shape and the structure of what's creating the electrons, uh, the electron precipitation in this case is much different. And our general oversimplified explanation didn't capture this detail of why there would be different patterns produced in auroras. The distinction is even more apparent if we look at a time-lapse video. And so this is a time-lapse video of discrete auroras. What words that come to mind for me as I look at this include things like variations in space and time or periodicity, uh, ripples. And those are all words that are associated with waves. So hang with me for a second. I'm gonna introduce a, a technical scientific term here. Notice the waviness that we see here. There are variations happening in this picture that are invoke the idea of waves. And so as we seek to expand this oversimplified explanation of electron precipitation, I'm gonna suggest that we should consider if waves are a part of explaining electron precipitation. So let's move on to this next question. Are waves a part of explaining electron precipitation? It turns out that waves are extremely common above auroras. And I'll show an animation that, that, that gives a sense of how waves are produced in Earth's magnetosphere. This is an artist rendition of Earth's magnetosphere. This is a, an animation that came from NASA. And one of the first things you might think as you look at this is, uh, wait a minute, this looks quite a bit different from the picture of the magnetosphere that was shown before. And that's correct. Um, the, the picture that I showed before was a very symmetric, the, the right-hand side of the picture looked the same as the left-hand side of the picture. But this is actually a more accurate 
drawing of Earth's magnetosphere. And that's because as the solar wind streams past the Earth, that, that flow of plasma coming out from the sun, it actually distorts Earth's magnetic field. So plasma or solar wind coming from the sun in this perspective would be coming in from the left and it would stretch out Earth's magnetic field as it moves along. So let's start the animation. And the goal here is to see how waves can be produced in the magnetosphere. So coming in from the left is the solar wind that can distort Earth's magnetic field, Earth's magnetic field and, and disturb it, creating variations or disturbances that, that travel along. And then as the magnetic field continues to get stretched out, we can see reconfiguration here. And this reconfiguration sends disturbances or sends waves traveling along the magnetic field. And what's implied by this animation is that as those waves come crashing down towards Earth, they create auroras. So let's see if we can make sense of that idea. It's, it's actually known that the waves that are found above auroras are elfane waves. So elfane waves are a type of electromagnetic wave that exists only in magnetized plasma. So magnetized plasma is when there are ions and electrons coexisting with a magnetic field. And one way to think about elfane waves is as waves on a string. So you know that if you take a string and you stretch it and you shake one end of the string, you produce waves that travel along. Similarly, if there are magnetic field lines in the presence of plasma, and you shake or, or some way disturb the magnetic field, that can produce waves that travel along the magnetic field. And that's exactly what elfane waves are. But the, the picture here is very similar to waves traveling along a string. And actually, uh, strikingly, the, the underlying mathematics, the, the differential equation that describes waves on a string is the same differential equation, of course, with different force terms, but the, the terms are, are directly analogous to the, the differential equation that creates elfane waves or describes elfane waves. So it's known that the waves above auroras are elfane waves. All right, let's take a look at this animation. Um, what I am I'm showing here, it's kind of hypnotic. If it's been a, a long day for you, perhaps this is making you sleepy. I apologize for that. But looking at this animation, what we see are magnetic field lines being really in a, in a very simplified, idealized way shaken left and right. And so all of these magnetic field lines are being disturbed. And the disturbances created here travel along the magnetic field like waves on a string. So if you imagine this as a whole bunch of strings that are being shaken, that would create the waves that travel along. But here we're in a magnetized plasma and we have elfane waves that, that travel along. And so uh, there's a way to identify these in uh, spacecraft data. And it's known that these are really common above auroras. So here is uh, a long standing hypothesis because it's actually been known for a long time that elfane waves are common in the magnetosphere. So here's the hypothesis. Some distant disturbance of the magnetic field of Earth's magnetic field creates variations or, or waves that travel along the magnetic field. So these are the elfane waves traveling along. And then at some point, those waves start to push the electrons that are out in the, the plasma out there, start to push those electrons down towards Earth. And so it's kind of this Rube Goldberg process of waves being created, waves traveling down towards Earth, and then the waves pushing electrons. And it's those electrons that then come crashing down to produce auroras. So this hypothesis has been in the literature for over 40 years at this point, but it's been an incredibly hard hypothesis to test using spacecraft data. And think about that. It, it, the reason why it's hard to test this hypothesis is because there's this dynamic transfer of energy from the waves to the electrons. The, the waves are traveling along and they're pushing the electrons down towards Earth and there's this process unfolding at least according to the hypothesis. And in order to see that, you would have to have a satellite in, in the midst of that process, watching it unfold. But unfortunately, satellites don't just sit out there in space. Satellites are zipping around in their orbit. And so as a satellite moves through this process, as it's unfolding, it's, it's very difficult to isolate 
how or if Elfane waves are actually pushing electrons down towards the Earth. So, so spacecraft have so far been, been foiled in their attempts to, to confirm or, or deny this hypothesis. Now, as we, as we go along, it's gonna become more important to actually know where the electrons start to be pushed down towards Earth. And this is one thing that, that satellite data are really well positioned to answer. So we have satellites sampling different regions of the magnetosphere. And actually what, what's been found is that if you're further out in the magnetosphere, so somewhere like out here, that electrons have not started moving down towards Earth, right? The electrons need to move down towards Earth to precipitate and produce auroras. And out in the outer regions of the magnetosphere, that hasn't started happening yet. But what satellites have found is that electrons start moving down towards the Earth in this lower region of the magnetosphere. So something is happening here to push the electrons down towards Earth and causing them to create auroras. So this isn't, this isn't the only spot where this would happen. There'd be a corresponding spot on the, the Southern hemisphere. And then also uh, there can be electron acceleration happening on the day side, uh, on the side of the Earth towards the sun as well. Uh, but it, it tends to be this lower region of the magnetosphere where electrons start to get pushed down towards the Earth. So this region of the magnetosphere has been named in the literature as the auroral acceleration region. This is the region where electrons are accelerated. It's, it's sometimes abbreviated the AAR. And just for brevity on the next couple slides, I'm gonna adopt that abbreviation. I'll call this region the AAR. And there's a lot of great survey data that gives us a sense of what's going on in the auroral acceleration region. Specifically, two satellites that I'm gonna focus on for a couple slides are the polar satellite, which is orbiting at a relatively higher altitude compared to the FAST satellite. So the FAST uh, satellite, FAST stands for Fast Auroral Snapshot Explorer. Uh, that, that acronym sounds like a bit of a stretch to me, um, but you know that, that's what it's called. It's the FAST satellite. And these two satellites kind of bookend a region of interest. They bookend the auroral acceleration region. So what's provided here from polar and fast and, and comparisons of their measurements is a look at what's flowing into the acceleration region. So polar gives us an idea of what's coming down into the auroral acceleration region. And fast gives us an idea of what's coming out the bottom what's flowing out the bottom of this region coming down towards Earth. And so comparisons of polar and fast are really powerful tools that help us constrain or get a sense for what's happening in between. So here's one look from polar. Polar, again, above the auroral acceleration region, found that Elfane waves are extremely common above auroras and they're carrying enough energy or enough power to account for about a third of all auroras. So this, this means that Elfane waves, if they're causing auroras, they wouldn't be causing all of them, but perhaps they could be causing some of the distinct features of auroras. So uh, let's take a look at this claim coming from uh, polar data. What's being shown on the left in panel A is a single representative photograph that was taken by polar. This is an ultraviolet photo. And what you can see here is actually a ring of auroras around the magnetic pole. So the magnetic pole would be right in the middle. And this feature is called the auroral oval. We tend to get ovals of auroras around the earth. It's super cool. Now on the left side of this picture is the sun illuminating this half of the earth. So that's the sunward side or the day side. And then on the right side of this picture is of course the anti-sunward side or the night side of the earth. And thousands of these photographs were taken and combined into an average picture that's shown here. So this is an average intensity map of the, the light that's produced by auroras. And what we find is that this oval is statistically persistent, right? It's there when we average together thousands of photographs. And this is actually, this is another place where oversimplified model fails, right? We said that this oversimplified model, it simply funnels electrons down towards the earth but there's no reason to expect from that simplified model that we would just get this oval of auroras. Okay, um, so let me just, let me familiarize you with some of the, the coordinates on here. 
90 degrees is referenced to the magnetic pole. So this is 90 degrees magnetic latitude. And then as we go down, we're decreasing in magnetic latitude. And what we find is that auroras are most common between about 60 and 70 degrees magnetic latitude. And then around the clock face here are numbers called magnetic local time. So noon, magnetic local time, is always pointing towards the sun, even though the earth is rotating underneath. The direction towards the sun is always noon, magnetic local time. And then midnight, or, or zero on this, this graph, is always pointed away from the sun. So that's midnight, magnetic local time. Okay, so this is, this is what Polar found with its thousands of photographs combined together, this average uh, intensity map. Polar also was measuring the presence of Elfane waves above the auroras. And what's presented here are the Elfane wave measurements sorted into the same coordinate system. And so what we see is that Elfane waves are present in this same kind of oval region, or this oval region around the magnetic pole. And also Elfane waves are especially strong in this part of this night sky where auroras are also especially strong. And so that means that there are strong, powerful Elfane waves commonly found above auroras, carrying an amount of energy that could actually account for a significant fraction of auroras, not all of them, but a significant amount. Now let's do a comparison. So let's take a look at how uh, polar data compares to fast data. So up above the auroral acceleration region, Polar is measuring Elfane waves and found that when auroras are active during geomagnetic storms, there is something like, on average, about six gigawatts of Elfane waves flowing down into this region. And so uh, we've got six gigawatts flowing into the auroral acceleration region as documented by Polar orbiting above the auroral acceleration region. Down below, coming out the bottom of the auroral acceleration region, FAST measures significantly less Elfane wave power, 2.62 gigawatts on average of Elfane wave power coming out the bottom of the auroral acceleration region. So this means that some amount of Elfane wave power has been absorbed or transitioned into some other form of energy in this region. So this begs the question, where did the power difference go? Where did roughly three and a half gigawatts of Elfane wave power go in between. Is it possible that that power went into electrons? Now, another thing that's notable is uh, brought out by doing what's called an epic analysis or an epoch analysis. And that's looking at how the presence of auroras and the presence of Elfane waves change during a geomagnetic storm. And one of the things that's been brought, brought out by this type of analysis, by looking at, at how things ramp up during geomagnetic storms, one thing that's been found is that auroras tend to increase along with Elfane waves. And so Elfane waves tend to be more present when there are additional auroras up, uh, in the sky. So that means, uh, just to summarize all of this, that means Elfane waves are often found above auroras and it's possible that they're contributing their energy to the electrons that then actually cause these auroras. But there's a, a remaining question here, right? These are, these are powerful comparisons and powerful correlations. They're very suggestive that Elfane waves are an important part of producing auroras. But they have, these comparisons haven't actually answered the question of whether Elfane waves cause auroras or merely occur alongside them. Right? We haven't demonstrated causality yet with any of these measurements. And so the next question that I wanna dive into is can Elfane waves actually energize electrons in the conditions of the auroral acceleration region? And to answer this question, uh, the, the team that I've, I've been a part of, we pivoted away from spacecraft measurements. We decided to take our experiments instead to the lab. And so experiments were performed using uh, a device called the Large Plasma Device, or LAPD for short. The person who built this experiment had a, had a sense of humor, as you can tell, uh, by, by giving it the acronym, the LAPD. This is an experiment that's located at UCLA, so not, not far from Irvine. And it is an experiment that was created specifically to study Elfane waves. 
And it's actually a shared experiment. It's an extremely valuable resource for the plasma physics community in the United States because they invite people from other schools to come in and run experiments and collect data and, and work collaboratively alongside their scientists. So here are some of the basic parameters of the experiment that we ran. Uh, we created a magnetic field of 1700 Gauss, which may not mean a lot to you until you compare it to the Earth's magnetic field, which is a half, a half Gauss. We created plasma that has about 10 to the 12 electrons per centimeter cubed. So N sub E is the density of electrons. So think about one cubic centimeter of volume, right? One thimble of volume. There's in, in the plasma that we use about 10 to the 12 electrons in there, which sounds like a fantastic number of electrons until you actually compare it to some other gases that we're familiar with. So like the density of air at STP is about seven orders of magnitude higher. And the, the temperature of the electrons is around 50,000 Kelvin in, in the experiment. And if you compare that to the temperature at, at STP of 273 Kelvin, 50,000 Kelvin sounds pretty remarkable. But in the world of plasma physics, 50,000 Kelvin actually, actually isn't that hot. Remember to get plasmas, you need, you need hot gases. And so uh, people in, in, in this line of research really specialize in, in high temperatures and, and can go much higher than 50,000 Kelvin. Okay, I, I brushed past the photo here in my effort to talk about the numbers. So let's take a minute and think about this photo. Uh, this is a picture of the LAPD. It's 20 meters from end to end. And the thing that, that probably jumps out at you first are actually these yellow coils and the purple coils. These are magnetic field coils or, or electromagnets that create a, a, a magnetic field that runs through the experiment. It, it actually, if, if you're familiar with uh, kind of basic electronics at all, these, these things work as a solenoid. So this is a massive solenoid that is created here by these coils. Now, if you can look past the coils down to what's inside of them, there is a vacuum chamber. And it's inside the vacuum chamber itself that we actually create the plasma and run our experiments. Okay, let me go through kind of the ingredients list if you wanted to make a magnetized plasma yourself. So let's say you're an aspiring plasma physicist and you want to make some magnetized plasma. One of the things that you're going to need is a vacuum vessel. So I was, I was showing that on the previous slide and here it is on our block diagram. Of course, for a vacuum vessel to be any good, you need a vacuum pump that will remove most of the, the, the air from the vacuum vessel. And then as was shown on the, the previous slide, you would also have a solenoid or these, these magnetic field coils. These are the electromagnets that wrap around the vacuum vessel. And when the solenoid is turned on, it creates magnetic field that runs through, oops, sorry, that, that runs through the vacuum chamber and creates this magnetic field. Okay, so in our effort to make magnetized plasma, what we have so far is a magnetic field. We're missing the plasma. To actually create plasma, what's done in, in an experiment like this is a puff of gas is intentionally leaked back into the chamber. And that allows us to have a controlled type of gas, a controlled species of gas present in the chamber. So for these experiments, we were puffing hydrogen into the chamber. And that's neutral gas. So in order to produce the phase transition to actually have plasma, there's then an energy source that can ionize this puff of gas. And so the energy source ionizes the puff of gas to produce plasma. And after all of that, what you have is a gas of ions and electrons interacting with the magnetic field. And then you can run experiments in this environment, in this magnetized plasma environment. You can run your experiments to actually try to recreate what's happening out in space and understand that better. Now it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty remarkable device, the, the LAPD, because this shot of plasma, this what's called a, just a, a burst of plasma is, is called a shot of plasma. A shot of plasma typically lasts about 10 milliseconds. And so you've got 10 milliseconds to run your experiment inside the, the environment produced by this plasma. But fortunately, the LAPD is set up for high repetition. And so you get a shot of plasma every second. So you get 10 milliseconds every second to, to repeat what you've done. All right, so let's go now to just a, a schematic of our setup in the LAPD. 
what we do is create Elfane waves. And so these are the waves that are found out in space above auroras. And then as those waves are being produced, we simultaneously measure something called the electron velocity distribution. Now, I know for many of you, you may not be familiar with this idea of a velocity distribution, and I'm going to unpack that on the next slide. But for right now, just think about the fact that we're creating Elfane waves that travel through this plasma. And then further down, uh, away from the antenna, we measure how the electrons respond or, or how the electrons interact with the Elfane wave. And, and we, we measure that interaction by, by recording something called the electron velocity distribution. It's often given this symbol G sub E. Okay, so now let's talk more about what velocity distributions are. Instead of talking more about electron velocity distributions, which is somewhat more abstract, I wanna take a moment and think about ping pong ball velocity distributions, because this is more concrete. We can actually lay eyes on this. So here is a video of somebody blowing ping pong balls around in a box. There's a jet of air at the bottom and the ping pong balls are being uh, blown across the box. And what you'll notice here, if you look at, at what's happening is some of the ping pong balls move really quickly. Like maybe your eye is attracted to the ping pong balls that shoot all the way across the box and, and strike the far side and then fall all the way back down. Those are the high velocity ping pong balls. But those ping pong balls are actually the minority. Most of the ping pong balls are congregated down here with much lower velocity. So let's take that insight and translate it into a histogram. So here are our axes. We have ping pong ball velocity on the horizontal axis. So right in the middle is zero velocity and then uh, large negative velocities, large positive velocities as we go to either side along this axis. On the vertical axis is the number of ping pong balls that we have moving at each velocity. So when we were looking at this video, what we found is that there were a lot of ping pong balls at low velocity. And so translating that to the histogram would look like this, right? We've got a lot of ping pong balls denoted on our histogram at low velocity. And as we go to kind of intermediate velocities, there's an intermediate number of ping pong balls. Some of them uh, uh, fewer, but, but still a significant number were moving at kind of intermediate speeds. But once we get out to the very greatest velocities, there were just a couple, right? There's just a few ping pong balls that are blowing all the way across this box at high speed. And so the, the histogram is much shorter over here. And what we've drawn here is an, a, a velocity distribution, a ping pong ball velocity distribution. And so this is simply a histogram of ping pong balls by velocity. And as I start talking about electron velocity distributions, you can keep this in mind. We're just talking about a histogram of electrons by velocity. So if Elfane waves are a part accelerating electrons, giving electrons energy, causing them to crash into the atmosphere to produce auroras, how would that actually happen? One way that could happen is by a process that looks kind of like surfing. So let's take a look at a surfing video. Uh, many of you live closer to a coast than I do, so you may have more experience with surfing, but we can still talk about the physics here. Uh, you'll notice that when I start this video, one surfer here, picked up the wave and, and was accelerated and, and rode along with the wave. But there were a lot of other surfers that didn't catch the wave. They weren't picked up and carried forward. So what's the difference? Why was this one surfer picked up and accelerated? And the reason actually is because that surfer was moving at the right initial speed to be picked up and, and carried by the wave. And all these other surfers aren't moving at the right initial speed to surf. So in the physics world, this is something called resonant acceleration. These are surfers that are resonating with the wave or, or this, this one surfer is resonating with the wave. Uh, that surfer has the right speed to be picked up and accelerated. And Elfane waves are predicted to be able to do something similar. So let's take a look at my surfing video. This is significantly less exciting but it does show the idea that electrons perhaps could surf on Elfane waves. So what we have here are two electrons. We have the surfing electron, which is shown in red, and then the slower electron, which is shown in gray. And the surfing electron is moving at the right initial speed to be picked up and pushed along by the wave. 
So the only distinction between these two electrons is their initial speed, right? This red electron is initially moving fast enough or moving at the right speed to be picked up and, and surf along with the wave. So this is something in the physics world called uh, Landau damping or, or Landau resonance, where electrons surf along uh, plasma waves. So this is one prediction of how electrons could be accelerated by L-fame waves. So let's go back to our velocity distribution, right? Our histogram of electrons by velocity. What would resonant acceleration look like, right? Electrons surfing, how would that manifest in the distribution function? So I've, I've changed the axes here. Now we're looking at electron velocity and the electron distribution. This is just demonstration data. This is not actually data from the lab. So this is just to demonstrate the, the point that I'd like to make on this slide. Well, if we have a wave, an Elfane wave moving through the plasma at some speed, and, and that wave, uh, the, the speed corresponds to something on this axis, like 10 centimeters per second. Um, what would happen is that electrons near that speed, those are the ones that could be picked up and accelerated. And so electrons surfing on Elfane waves would look like this. We'd get a bump, right? These electrons were picked up and pushed along to uh, create a bump in the distribution. So this would be a, a telltale sign that electrons are surfing on Elfane waves. And then putting this back in context, this would be a way for electrons to gain the energy that they need, gain the velocity that they need to come crashing into the atmosphere to create auroras. So this is one of the things we are looking to, to see if this actually occurs with Elfane waves in lab plasmas. And here's what we found. So we have unprecedented measurements of the electron distribution that look something like this. What we see here is the electron distribution. It's, it's oscillating, it's going up and down. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's this panel that is showing the, the Elfane wave. The Elfane wave is moving past the place where we measure the distribution. And this is what the distribution is doing. Now that's interesting that the distribution is kind of wiggling around at the frequency of the wave, but there's no bump there. Right? We're not seeing a, a bump that is uh, persistent showing up and uh, staying present as a result of the L fan wave. And so this is, this is pushing the envelope, or when these measurements were made, they were pushing the envelope, looking into how do electrons and L fan waves interact with each other. But when we saw this, we also had a bit of a, a, we had a period of time where we had to scratch our heads and try to figure out what's actually going on here. Um, are we actually seeing electrons surfing on waves or not? And after scratching our heads for uh, a bit, actually this, this data was collected uh, in 2018 and we've, we've been scratching our heads for a few years. What we found is that uh, we actually don't have a large enough plasma device. So the large plasma device is indeed too short to see the bump develop. So our experiments had a baseline of about five meters to them. If we extend out to 26 meters, then the interaction of the, the waves and the electrons would be sufficient to produce the bump that's, that's predicted, at least according to the simulation. But for our, our shorter measurements, all we see is a little distortion of the electron distribution. So this caused us to scratch our heads even more. And eventually we came up with a key realization that we can calculate, not just, we don't have to look solely for a bump in the distribution, but we could look for uh, energy being transferred from the Elfane wave to the electrons. And we realized that we actually already had the existing measurements to be able to do that. So we can calculate the energy being transferred to the electrons and look at, at how electrons are gaining energy. And here is what we found. So this is our main experimental result that came out last year. We found that electrons are in fact accelerated by surfing on Elfane waves. And this was the graph that we used to demonstrate that. Let me, let me show you. So what's being shown here is the energy gained by electrons according to the speed of electrons. So electrons with these speeds are not gaining energy from the wave, but electrons with, with uh, velocities over here are gaining energy from the wave. That's what this, this positive value means. And so this 
happens to be velocities near the speed of the wave itself. And so electrons with speeds or velocities near the velocity of the wave are gaining energy. And this was our evidence. This was our experimental result showing that electrons actually are surfing on elfane waves, even if they haven't been surfing long enough for the telltale bump to show up in the distribution. Okay, so electrons with this initial velocity uh, are gaining energy. Now, uh, the, the review process for this was grueling and it actually resulted in a much better paper. But one of the questions we got from the reviewer was, can this actually account for anything? Which is a great question. Um, and it, it caused us to go back and strengthen the, the several arguments of our paper and extend our work. And what the reviewer meant was, if you look out into space, uh, at, if this process is happening and it's happening in the way that, that we claim that it's happening in the lab, can that actually account for the energy that electrons need to produce auroras? And so after uh, some comparisons, what we found in our experiment is that electrons are gaining about 80,000 electron volts per second. If you're not familiar with electron volts, don't worry about it. They're gaining 80,000 units of energy per second in the experiment. And if we take characteristic values for what's happening in the auroral uh, acceleration region, the auroral zone, we find that electrons there must be gaining about 80,000 electron volts per second as well. And furthermore, we were able to conclude that this energy transfer that we see in the experiment is actually caused by the Elfane waves because we're, we're connecting the measurements of the wave with how the, the electrons themselves are responding. And so we're able to um, conclude that, that we are actually seeing energy going to the electrons from the Elfane waves. So when this was published in June of 2021, this caught some media attention. And that's because anything having to do with auroras, uh, people are interested in. And so it showed up in CNN. Uh, the, the headline says, the mysterious origin of the Northern Lights has been proven. Uh, NPR said, we finally know what causes the Northern Lights. Uh, popular science. And then there was this great article that showed up in a, a newspaper, the Daily Maverick in South Africa. Uh, and actually just recently on, on Christmas Eve, there was uh, an interview that I, I participated in that showed up on Science Friday. And these, these headlines are uh, stretching a little bit the conclusions that we came to. If you actually read the stories, the, the stories are quite good, but we didn't answer everything about auroras. What we did do is answer a longstanding question. We answered the question, can Elfane waves that are, are often found above auroras, can those Elfane waves actually contribute to pushing electrons down towards Earth, causing them to precipitate and produce auroras? And what we found is yes, that electrons can, or Elfane waves can push electrons down towards the Earth, causing them to, to produce auroras. So that was a long standing question in the world of auroras, rural physics. So, what's next? I, I often get a question about where do we go from here? It seems like we've buttoned up a research question and it's time to find a new research question. And that's true. So there are a bunch of tools that were developed here in the laboratory study. And the tools were used here to look at how electrons gain energy in conditions that are relevant to auroras. But there are all sorts of other places in space, in, in the plasma of space, where particles gain energy. And we wanna know more about that. So for example, the solar corona is much hotter than the surface of the sun. And we wanna know where do the particles in the solar corona get their energy from? We, could, we now have tools that we can use in the laboratory to address a question like that. Similarly, the energetic particles that make up cosmic rays and the Van Allen radiation belts, there are open questions there about how those particles come to be energized. And, and we have the laboratory tools to start looking into that. So in conclusion, we have the first direct measurement showing that electrons can be accelerated by Elfane waves in the conditions of the auroral acceleration region. And I'd like to say thank you so much for sticking with me. Um, I, I've run a few minutes over, but if you're interested in, um, in reading more, you could scan this QR code. This is a, a blog post that I contributed to a, a Nature Community blog. And then you could also scan this QR code, which takes you to our Nature Communications paper that came out uh, last year. Thank you so much.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim.